All right, well, it looks like we're recording now, so I'm gonna get us started. Uh, welcome everyone to Canopy's webinar, Greening the Outdoor Classroom, Bringing Nature to School Campuses. Canopy is an urban forestry nonprofit that plants and cares for trees throughout the Mid Peninsula and is hosting this webinar series to offer guidance from Bay Area experts on ways to ensure resilient urban forests by providing useful tools and information to decision makers. Next slide, please. Before we begin, we would like to announce that Canopy is seeking candidates for the Tree Program Senior Manager position. This person will be responsible for overseeing all of Canopy's tree programs, which include planting, tree care, surveying, and some education and advocacy. Please visit the Canopy website to read the full job description, and we encourage interested folks to apply as soon as you like. So for technical support today, please send any uh, messages you have where you need help in the chat. Natalie Brubaker, Canopy's Education Director, will help you out there. So the chat box is at the bottom. Please use that for tech support. Uh, any questions you have for speakers, please put those in the Q&A. There's a Q&A button at the bottom where you can type those in. My name is Elise Willis and I will be moderating the questions today by typing responses to any that I can during the presentations or uh, we'll wait until the end of the presentations where I'll ask our speakers during our um, nice long Q&A time. Some questions may not be answered today, so if we run out of time, we will compile the unanswered questions with responses and add them to the Canopy website early next week. And just a reminder, this webinar will be recorded and will be uploaded to the Canopy website along with presentation slides and links to relevant resources. So we've got you all covered. So following this webinar, you will be prompted to fill out a survey and we thank you in advance for your feedback and ISA certified arborists that fill out the survey will have their information submitted to ISA for 1.5 CEUs, or you can grab the CEU code from us. So now I would like to introduce our wonderful speakers today. We have Jamie Zaplatosh, who is the Director of Green Schoolyards for Healthy Communities at Children and Nature Network where she works with partners around the world towards the vision that all communities will have access to green schoolyards school yards by 2050. Lauren Friels is a landscape architect at Bay Tree Design and has worked throughout the Bay Area on school and community landscapes, working with districts, volunteers, and community partners to provide living schoolyards. And finally, we have Devin Conley, it, who is the board president of the Mountain View Wisman School District. Devin's career in education spans the past 19 years and includes working in education policy research and teaching elementary school in the Bay Area. So we have three wonderful speakers we're gonna hear from today. And without further ado, Jamie Zaplatosh will take it away. Thank you. Get over to my share screen. So good morning, everyone. Um, I'm calling in from Chicago. So I am um, calling in from the ancestral lands of the Miami, Potawatomi, Sioux, Peoria, and Kickapoo peoples. And I am on this slide acknowledging all of my um, co-researchers as well as colleagues who have helped um, do the work putting this presentation together, whether um, with me or actually working on the research. So I wanted just to give them acknowledgement. Um, would definitely not be here presenting on this without them. So I'm really excited with you, uh, or to be here with you today, um, talking about green the outdoor classroom and all the research behind um, what we know are the benefits of greening the, the schoolyards. And it's exciting to be able to advocate for more trees, please. So my objectives over the next 24 minutes or so are to share Children in Nature Network resources as well as green schoolyards information 
uh, discuss the benefits of green schoolyards and the research supporting these benefits, and then present the findings of greening for academic achievement, prior prioritizing what to plant where. So over the past several generations, childhood has moved indoors. And while so much is technologically advancing, we're seeing what researchers call deaths of despair that is really correlated to um, this indoor time. And deaths of despair are deaths by suicide, alcohol use, and drug abuse. And depression and anxiety is on the rise. And this is already pre-pandemic. Actually, the statistics are quite um, stark, um, adding in pandemic um, statistics. But especially surprising is the rise of these uh, mental is health issues with children and young children. So pre-pandemic, the National Institute of Health reported that just over 20% of children or one in five in the US either currently or at some point during their life had had a seriously debilitating mental disorder. I'm a mother of an 11 year old girl. Um, she'll be 12 year old, uh, 12 soon. And I'm definitely seeing some of these issues, particularly with the pandemic with her. And I'm just really worried about what her life is gonna be like, what her entire generation's life is gonna be like. And ultimately it's the well-being of the, the health and well-being of our country that we're talking about. Um, it's pretty, pretty significant, um, the impacts of being indoors as much as we are. And while we know it's not a panacea, um, we know that nature really does have the power to make children happier, healthier, and smarter. And it, it, it has the ability to mitigate many of the issues that, um, that this indoor transition has been creating. So the Children Nature Network is really focused on ensuring that all children have equitable access to nature where they live. And we're focused on collecting research and curating resources for case making along with supporting cities, families and school districts for equitable system wide access to nature. Before I go any further, I really wanna say a little bit about green schoolyards. We're not talking specifically about green schoolyards today. It's trees in the outdoor campus, which is, but you can tell by this slide, um, trees are a part of a green schoolyard. But the research that I'm gonna talk about really is rooted in these, uh, this definition, that green schoolyards are mul multifunctional spaces that are designed for and by the entire school community and include many elements like outdoor classrooms, different types of gardens, stormwater, capture, play equipment, trails, and trees, of course. In the, the framing, I, the last bit of framing I want to get uh, say before I get into the research is to um, say that we have this Green Schoolyards Action Agenda that we have co-created with over 100 partners around the world, actually, um, that really created this, uh, this vision that you see here. And the action agenda, which you can endorse and sign on to, and school, many school districts actually have, um, outlines policies, funding mechanisms, and research needed in order for us to get to a joint, this joint vision that all US communities offer access to green schoolyards by 2050 to enhance children's healthy development, community well being, and positive environmental impacts. And this work is very personal to me. Now, I grew up um, in Chicago on the south side of Chicago being raised by my single dad, um, which was very uncommon in the early 80s. And I, there were a lot of stresses in our lives. I was fortunate to grow up across the street from a park. So I was able to literally just look out the window and see this expansive green space full of trees that was able to provide respite and calm and decompression for me as a child. And not everybody has the opportunity to have a park across the street from their house, but um, there is, very likely a school nearby that is not all that it could be. And that's why I really want to see this vision that all communities have ha access to green schoolyards. So they're like parks during, this, the, during out of school time and out extensions of the classroom during out of school time or during, excuse me, school time and really being able to embed those throughout communities across the United States. So what about the pandemic? We can't ignore what's happening um, very um, 
and that's very relevant to all of us right now. Hopefully you're all very aware of this national COVID outdoor, outdoor learning initiative um, that's been spearheaded by four California based organizations and really has been a collective impact project of over a thousand people working across the country to really create resources to support outdoor learning. Um, you know, the, the case for green schoolyards right now um, and, out, and, and outdoor learning has never been stronger than it has during the pandemic. And so we're, uh, these spaces are able to provide safe places for learning and play outside, but also places of respite and calm to de-stress for youth and adults alike to talk about, um, bring in some more of the mental health issues that I talked about at the beginning. So this, uh, a link to this resource will be included in, um, in the resources as well. Just wanna make sure you all know about it, but it, a, lot of, a lot of great information is there, so I'm not gonna dive into that too much. So now on to the research. So green schoolyards, depending on how they're designed and used, which is key, really have the ability to provide so many benefits. And this graphic was created as part of our, uh, the Children Nature Network's initial survey of what was happening on green schoolyards around the country that we had a report that was published in 2016. And then it was also updated by a, a group of research advisors and academics that we worked with um, to include this outer ring, really honing in to these four buckets of benefits that green schoolyards provide. So community, health and wellness, environment and learning. And as you can see, you know, there isn't really an even, um, uh, it, it's not cut and dry as to how these benefits fall um, within the wheel and, and to the external, um, external categories. There's so many benefits that green schoolyards can provide. And especially if you're thinking about um, starting a new program or helping to identify additional partners, whether it's for green schoolyards or tree planting, really thinking about the people who care about these benefits on the inside of the circle um, is a good way of bringing in um, other partners that are able to help uh, achieve co-benefits with you, even if you're looking for different outcomes by planting trees and greening schoolyards. So I, I mentioned at the beginning that the Children Nature Network provides and creates a lot of um, research and resources in order to advance um, the equitable access um, movement for children uh, to nature. Right, that was a funny sentence. Um, came out all wrong. But um, this is these are two examples of what those resources look like. And this is all peer-reviewed, published research that shows up in graphics that are all available on our website for download and use and advocacy. And I know that that's. Um, what the intent of these webinar, this webinar series is, is to help you be able to advocate for any of the benefits or tree planting in, in specifically that is um, that you'd like to do in your in your own communities. And I, I've seen these these uh, infographics work really well. The one on the left side, the mayor of Providence, when I met with him in. 2017, I think it was, he, I, I was able to hand over our stack of infographics and he picked up this one on the left side that the mental health benefits and he said, green schoolyards can help take care of my children from cradle to career, I'm in. And of course, creating a whole green schoolyards program and greening schoolyards is a long process and it didn't happen overnight, but he was able to then direct his staff to start um, putting in city budget dollars into, um, into schoolyard greening to really make sure that these benefits were able to be realized throughout Providence, Rhode Island. They're still early on, um, but it's you know, baby steps and all the tools that we have are, are ones that we wanna use. So I'm gonna switch more into the, the pure focus of the research benefits. So nature-based learning is an approach to enhancing learning through contact with views elements and settings, as well as pedagogy utilizing the natural environment as the context for learning. So learning in, with, and through nature, but not necessarily about nature. And I just want to kind of say that this is going to set up the framework for the rest of um, my slides for this um, morning for you all. The 
National um, Association, the North American Association of Environmental Education and the Children and Nature Network applied for a National Science Foundation grant and were able to bring together a bunch of researchers to really hone in on what was it about nature-based learning that was leading to the outcomes that were um, that we're seeing. And I'm going to get into some of their work here. And in particular, um, Kathy Jordan, my colleague at Children Nature Network, and Ming Kuo were the primary authors for this work. So this graphic um, and, and the research um, article that is I'm, I'm citing here is also going to be part of your resources that um, are on the website shows these three buckets here. We're showing context, mechanisms, and outcomes for why nature had, leads to these benefits. And on the left side, you're gonna see all the different types of nature exposure. So I'm actually just gonna to switch to that. Um, and just that graphic has a lot going on. And so I wanna hone in um, your attention to this. Um, but on the left side, what we're seeing is classroom views, vegetation around schools and homes, school gardens, outdoor classes, that these are some of the things that are leading to ultimately these outcomes on the right side. And I'm really gonna hone in on the academic component because that's what um, the research that I worked on um, is primarily focused on. So those um, exposure to all different types of nature can lead to these, these outcomes on the right-hand side. So academic achievement specifically increased retention of subject matter content, higher standardized test scores, better grades, better reading math and writing um, skills. Sorry, I'm, I'm covering up some of the text on the screen and um, higher graduation rates, as well as personal development and stewardship. And so an example of that um, in thinking about those uh, nature leading to those outcomes is this study by Matsuoko that was published in 2010 that assessed the views outside of 101 public high schools in Michigan. Um, you know, so this research that we're seeing is, um, and, and the outcomes are across all grade levels. I just wanna make sure that, that I raise that. Um, the, the studies have been done in elementary, middle and high schools, and, and we'll get into that a little bit more too. But what, you're seeing on the lower right-hand side of this slide is what a, one of those views would look like outside of a classroom or outside of a cafeteria that just the views outside the window can lead to what you see here is these higher standardized test scores, higher graduation rates, higher percentages of students planning to attend a four-year college and fewer occurrences of criminal behavior, as opposed to the upper right-hand picture, um, which actually shows this more desolate, um, just grass, not very um, vertically green, um, and, and a lot of concrete in the in the parking lot. Um, that is leads to negative associations with those same um, same outcomes, or leading to negative outcomes for all of um, if they if they are exposed to that view, and. I guess I, I want to underscore here, and you'll hear it again, is that um, when we talk about green, we are typically not talking about grass because grass does not afford enough of uh, enough variation for our brains and our um, our learning, our our physical and cognitive. Um, parts of our body to actually create those benefits. So grass is green, um, but that wouldn't be considered a, a feature that is really leading to these outcomes. And so how does all this work? So you've got the nature exposure on um, the one side leading to these outcomes. And I'm gonna dig in a bit more around the mediator, the how and the why. So when we're talking about how we get to these benefits, it's really the impacts on the learner and the learning context that, that we're still learning a lot about, and there's. I'm going to get into a couple of theories around this, but this is again all going to be context for the last um, last part of what I'll be talking about. So the learner, what you'll see are these benefits about being outside or having the green view. Is they're able to concentrate better, they're less stressed more self-disciplined, more engaged, and more physically active. And the learning context, so actually 
their experience um, in those spaces or looking at those spaces is that that the, the learning um, area is or the classroom or the outdoor space is calmer, quieter, in a safe, safer social context. It's warmer and it leads to warmer and more cooperative social context. And typically there's more autonomy, especially if you're outside versus just having the, um, the, the view outside. So all together, um, here's this graphic again, um, and you will see all of these slides uploaded um, afterwards, but to really, um, that really just breaks down what we're seeing and, and how this research actually works and, and what the benefits, how we get to these benefits. So the couple of theories that we are, um, that we can point to as why this is all happening, especially to the learner and the learning context. One theory is attention restoration theory, which is was published by Kaplan and Kaplan. And what this talks about is our brains being able to actually find restoration by not being so heavily focused on something cognitive. So being able to look up at a tree, look out in a garden, look at a fire while it's burning, things that don't overly stress or tax our brains, which is typically what happens when we're outside. But even um, I'm looking out my window right now and I have a green view outside um, my office window where even just being able to look outside at that space provides your brain some downtime, whether you're an adult or a child, and really allows you to then get back to more hyper-focused learning or, or activity. So if you're able to rest your brain by looking at these green views, then you're also able to then focus better afterwards. And this is, it makes sense. I mean, I think intuitively all of us know this um, or have felt this, but it's, it's a theory still, um, but this, that's a bit about why the learning is better um, afterwards and even during um, being outside and, and looking at green views. Um, one of the other theory, theories is stress recovery theory. And so being out in nature really decreases your cortisol levels, increases your endorphins, and this real phys physiological response is happening. And that allows you to focus better and learn more, um, which is gonna lead to all the benefits that I'll talk about again in a moment. Um, and it, that again makes sense. If you think about all of us, how we felt, especially earlier on in the pandemic, I Feel like most of us were in a brain fog um, for on and off, you know, for months, if not uh, many, many months, because there was so much anxiety, there was so much change, and you saw a lot of movement outside if people had access to it to really kind of um, bring our respite and calm to ourselves. And that's what this, um, this theory is about. It's, it's that there is a physiological response happening of being out in nature, which then helps you to be able to focus more and be more productive. Lastly, I'm gonna talk about um, the, the study that I was able to be part of, Greening for Academic Achievement, Prioritizing What to Plant Where. So, um, I was asked to be part of Samantha Klein, Sam's um, graduate thesis committee, where she was really interested in the fact that there were so, that the transition from elementary school to middle school is a really big transition. And typically that's where you see a lot of academic um, decline happening. And she knew because she had been at, she's at the, um, or she was at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, which is also where Ming Kuo is, as well as Andrea Faber-Taylor and Bill Sullivan, all of who are great researchers um, in the, the space around schoolyard greening um, and nature benefits and, and the design behind them. She was there and being exposed to all of this research and just really paused because she is a middle school teacher and was like, you know what, we're seeing all of this decrease in academic performance. What if schoolyards were greener and what types of greening would actually lead to more benefits during this transition. You think about going from elementary school where if you're going to have a green schoolyard program, that's where um, most uh, programs are focused. Um, you're, you have recess time, you have um, even just sometimes physical activity is outside, your, your PE time is outside. Then you get to middle school and classes are super short. You can't really, it's hard to get 
make the transition outside during the school day. And typically there's no focus on the outdoor environment and there's yet yeah, there's definitely not, not recess time anymore. And so she really was like, hmm, I think there's a, a gap in the research to say, would there be a benefit of schoolyard greening, even if people, or even if the students aren't outside actually learning in those spaces? And would, um, would that foster some, or alleviate some of the negative effects of the transitions to middle school? So in particular, the study was focused on these three questions. Could greening boost academic achievement in sixth graders? Should trees be the focus of greening efforts to boost achievement? And where should greening efforts be focused? So the particular, the particulars of, um, of the study is that there were 450 public middle schools that were focused on that all have um, published uh, academic standardized test scores that are out, out there. And the year that was focused on um, was 2010 and 2011, that academic school year. And that information, specifically the reading and math tests, were overlapped with um, the different GIS assessments of how much green was around the school, what types of greening, and how far out was that greening, and so and, and how that would affect um, academic outcomes. So there was a lot of a lot of um, co-founding variables and um, st uh, characteristics that were taken out, especially um, income levels, to really just make sure that the, the the playing field was even and the outcomes were the same. And in particular, these are the results that um, greener greener schools have higher test scores even after taking income into account. Middle school students may get a boost from school greening and planting trees within 250 meters specifically may boost scores the most. So I'm gonna get into a little bit more about how this all worked. So um, this is a graph that we produced that is, and I'm gonna show you and hopefully you can see my cursor okay, um, that, will, that is where I want you to focus specifically. So the, I, the in initial attention was looking at these uh, spatial um, layers. So these levels of greenness, um, what were those impacts in the amount of green that you saw, whether it's tree canopy or total green, which includes shrubs and grass, and what were those impacts on standardized test scores? And so what you're looking at here is where the where we're going to hone in is that the, the biggest noticeable difference here is on trees within 250 meters um, on both reading and math. So this is significantly higher um, results in the data assessment of the trees versus the total green. And so that, that led, and, and there were so many different um, uh, spatial assessments that were done around this to make sure that it wasn't one, one element or another that was really tipping the scales around the benefits. And the same is true for math. So in, in here, you're seeing um, negative numbers for total green um, in their impacts. And in the trees, you're seeing positive numbers here in the coefficient category for both reading and math. And on, in, in this in particular, you're seeing a stronger correlation in math. But when we look at what nearby versus distant landscaping looks like, so we're talking about 250 meters of tree canopy. So I, I, I need to slow down one second. So what we saw from all the other, um, the assessment of green, total green versus tree canopy was that tree canopy, what was, it was what was actually um, leading to those impacts for academic test scores. And so honing in on trees specifically, then how close by do trees need to be around the school in order to have these impacts? So again, looking at the coefficient in the reading um, and the math here, um, showing the difference of 250 meters um, of where the tree canopy is around the school versus a thousand meters. The, the, the numbers are all stacked up in, um, the, in favor of the more immediate um, location of trees around schools. And particularly here, there's actually a higher correlation for math scores around um, once we actually just focused on trees specifically. 
So um, our recommendations based on this study is that um, planting trees in and immediately around schoolyards has the potential to be an inexpensive and simple way to boost academic achievement performance. And so when designing new schoolyards or doing upgrades to schoolyard renovations, trees themselves are, are one of the key drivers to improving academic performance. The second bullet point here is talking about, so it, um, school facilities um, folks always, or almost all of them have assessments of their schoolyards um, and what all the features are. It's both indoors and outdoors. It's something that most school districts have. They, they know how many square feet of concrete, you know, is on a, on a specific schoolyard. They know how many um, square feet of sports field is there. And so including school greenness and specifically trees planted on a school campus is a really good recommendation for school districts and facilities departments to include in their assessments because of what we're seeing here of being able, you know, this is one study um, and we're not quite to the causal, um, causal uh, part of recommendations, which I'll get to in the next slide, but we, do we are seeing these benefits. So if you imagine that you have no choice but to send your child to your neighborhood school and your neighborhood school is completely covered in concrete and the other school a mile away is completely green and has trees, the likelihood of your child performing um, well academically is significantly better if if they're not at the school with all concrete, but it's at the school with the green, with a green campus and trees planted. And that's just really stark information to know um, and not, um, and it, it, I feel like it makes me um, from an equity standpoint really want, um, want to do more about that. Um, and hopefully it makes you all feel like you wanna advocate around schoolyard um, tree planting as well. And the, the last, bullet point that here, that's listed here. So if more randomized controlled trials, so there's um, there's a lot more to do than, um, because this before, or this the way the study was set up here was not able to show causal effects. Um, but if there were more randomized controlled trials that show these benefits, what increasing school tree cover could, imp could impact over um, in these 450 schools, over 50,000 students and increasing them to at grade level reading and math in Washington state. And that's at about $119 per student per score. And we're gonna get more, Lauren um, and Devin, I think are both gonna talk a little bit more about um, tree planting and maintenance all have their costs. But if we think about what the costs of computers are, when we think about the cost of painting a classroom is that not the computers don't have benefits or schoolyard or, or school walls. Um, we know that there's psychological benefits um, to them as well. But if we're so focused on the indoor, inside of the building when the outside for not that much money can be improved to really impact academic performance, um, I, it just feels like this is something that everybody should know um, and we should all be advocating more for because the cost just isn't as steep as a lot of the other um, inputs are. Wanted to just uh, stop or end on these two resources. Um, if you're not aware of our research library, we have over a thousand peer reviewed, published and synthesized research articles that are on our website that you can um, use to make the case. And we have a, a, re a research digest, which is this is showing you how to sign up um, on our website that will help you get more information on a regular basis around this um, and highly recommend just checking it out if you're help needing to make the case. And then we also have, if you're focused, whether it's uh, on equitable access to nature for children, um, for, through schoolyards, through outdoor learning, through cities, um, there, we have a whole resource hub on our website that includes all these components um, that this is specifically focused on green schoolyards, but we have a resource hub that will provide a lot of um, recommended resources so that you don't have to start from scratch if you're trying to support equitable access to nature in any of these ways um, on your own um, schoolyard, in your own city, or in your community. And that is it for me. 
So thank you all so much. And I'm looking forward to taking a look at the questions that you shared. Thanks so much, Jamie. We appreciate it. Next up, we'll hear from Lauren Friels. Uh, okay, <laughs> I'm unmuted. <laughs> That's great. Uh, I just want to thank you guys all for being here, for being passionate enough about trees on schoolyards um, and trees in general in our urban environments that to come to this um, webinar today. I'm going to pick up uh, basically where Jamie left off. Um, We've got a lot of whys we can get really excited about how important it is to get um, particularly trees on school yards for all the reasons that Jamie listed as well as um, the environmental improvements from a, like reduced heat island effects and storm model infiltration and all those things but we can often come to this point where like we're excited we know that we want to do this but how do we do it how do we get our school district or our school or our principal or our community um, excited enough and equipped enough to actually put the trees in the ground on the schoolyard? Um, so that's what I'm going to talk about today. And this first image um, is from Coombe School in England. Um, this is a great example um, of a school that had transformed over the course of 40 years. So there's a headmaster, Sue Humphreys, um, who when she started at this school, it was um, aggressively bare is what she would call it. It had um, a field, a chain link fence, and that was it. And over the course of 40 years, she implemented a tree planting program um, that really valued the outdoor educational space and transformed her school into a place that you can let you, as you can see here, has an immersive natural, um, is an immersive natural setting, setting primarily through the planting of trees uh, that provides all those benefits Jamie was talking about. Um, so this is the goal, right? <laughs> um, and the question is, how do you get there? Oh, if I could get my slides to go. All right, so uh, during the course of this talk, I'm gonna give you a little, a brief introduction. Um, I'm gonna discuss like how, how we get understanding the issues um, that you're gonna face if you start to advocate for planting trees on schoolyards um, and how you work around that. And then before you go plant the trees, some key negotiation points that can make it easier for you to do, to, to get trees in the schoolyard setting. Um, and just reiterate the end goal. So briefly, this is what we've got. <laughs> uh, a lot of schoolyards in California in particular uh, look like this, where it's heavy on the asphalt, heavy on the ball play, light on the nature, natural experience, um, a lot of man-made surfaces and not a lot of restorative, um, immersive, natural experience. Um, and then just briefly, these schoolyards tend to, to have an elementary level of like 300 to 500 students, and then you can go upwards of that. To my, my middle schoolers school has um, 1,500 students um, that are using that, that yard, that outdoor space every day. What we want is kind of like in these images with there's Kuhn School and a, a school in Taiwan. Um, both of these are elementary schools, but this immersive natural quality pr provided by the trees uh, while like allowing for the space you need to have outdoor education spaces, to have the pedestrian spaces you need, um, still pr provides that restorative environment through planting trees. Uh, a number of the examples I've so shown so far are in um, Europe, but this can happen here too. Um, a couple of the key milestones we want to get through in order to accomplish this are first, you got to plant the tree in a healthy condition. So you got to get the approval to plant the tree. You got to find the space to put it in. And then second, you need to maintain that tree in a healthy condition for five years. Um, if you can get through that first five years um, with a newly planted tree, then um, you have what is going to take minimal upkeep. Um, for a natural, like uh, minimal and considering like a lawn you have to mow, like, you know, at least 
like probably like every every month or so, if not more. Trees you can basically ignore as far as maintenance is concerned, except for when like blowing leaves and things like that. Um, after that first five years, and you'll be able to enjoy it for decades. So the tree, a tree on a schoolyard, is has a lot of longevity as a natural invention, and it's also highly resilient if you can get it planted in the right place and maintained for those first five years. Uh, so yes, you can do this in California too, even though a lot of the images I've shown so far are from Europe or Asia. Um, these are three examples of schools that have done this in the Bay Area. Um, so a private school in Oakland, a private school on the peninsula, and then on the far right, this is actually um, after a year of their green schoolyard renovation. This is the school we saw, that aggressively bare school we saw on the, the other slide um, at once its tree planting program had begun. And already after a year of establishment, this is a very different place than the place you saw before. Um, so just to understand the issues. So you're all excited. You're like, I know that having trees on schoolyards is the thing to do. Uh, the thing to know is that at that point, you have the excitement you need, but you need to be willing and capable of uh, negotiating uh, with the different actors involved in order to implement successfully a tree planting program. Um, and my experience is primarily working with public school districts um, on public sites as opposed to private schools. So that'll be the actors involved at a private school will be, will be different. Um, but in, in our public school settings, uh, the big hurdle is time and money. Um, time and money are scarce. We all know that. Um, it's a broken system. Um, so when time and money are scarce, that means that we don't have currently often, currently we don't often have the resources we need to maintain a rich outdoor environment. Uh, while trees are the most resilient um, natural intervention we can do on schools, sometimes we don't even have the time and money to provide the maintenance they need. Um, so understaffed and overstretched facilities departments um, can, uh, who have experience with interventions that went badly in the past um, can often be really hard to work with. And when you're saying, I want, I want to plant new trees. Um, this is true also for like superintendents and, and district staff and, and principals and teachers because they have this experience of long-term um, issues on their schoolyards. Uh, because of this lack of money. So this, this picture here, this map here is a map of um, schoolyards in the Bay Area. In, in the orange are highlighted like the actual land areas of schools around, um, around our, our Bay. Um, if you focus in on Oakland, that's 87 schools. And I believe currently those 87 schools, which is a lot of land area, are cared for by eight landscape facilities. And this is not an, unco an uncommon um, kind of ratio. So each one of those landscape maintenance people has to take care of upwards of 10 schools. Um, and that's an almost impossible task. And in, in that environment, they tend to see trees as more work without weighing all the benefits that Jamie um, discussed. Um, and what we have to do as advocates is address their concerns in a way that their concerns and their issues in a way that really puts that um, means that we can get a long term intervention. Luckily, there's a really great counter message <laughs> for that the, those time and money kind of types of concerns. Um, the first one is to really drill down on what Jamie was talking about and with the principals and superintendents and school boards and facilities departments really talk about how trees work for us that they provide um, student and ecosystem services, and they make our schools better. Um, the second one that I think is really big one is that the right tree in the right place planted with an established maintenance plan is an easy to maintain cost effective investment. Um, and I'm going to walk through what the right tree and the right place and what an establishment maintenance plan looks can look like um, for success. And if you can really work your district and those those partner those community partners through these steps, you can change um, their concerns into ideas about opportunities for tree planting, and you can change skeptics into tree advocates. And and that's really the goal. Um, 
is to have long-term buy-in on planting trees on schoolyards. Uh, so the right tree, <laughs> we'll talk about we'll talk about this. So a lot of districts um, or public school, individual public schools have like the one tree they're comfortable planting and maybe it's a crepe myrtle and it's like 20 feet tall and it doesn't really provide a lot of shade. It doesn't provide an immersive experience. Um, so the first thing to do, one of the first things to do is negotiate to expand that tree list so that you can get trees that provide lots of shade, trees that are appropriate next to fields, um, trees that are good over parking lots or paved areas so they don't have a lot of litter, um, trees that are okay next to buildings. They're not going to like have branches drop on things or have pavements that lift. Um, so in order to do that, I have two key resources I've listed here, and this is going to show up on the website later. Um, the first one I really love to use is called Select Tree. Um, it's produced by Cal Poly, and it's a data searchable database that lists trees um, by the, their kind of qualities. So you're like, I need a tree that's good under power lines and um, a seaside environment that's okay with wind and is low water use. And you can search by those categories and find a tree that works for you. Um, this means that you can kind of zoom in on what your school district and what your school sites need um, so that you can pick trees that will be successes on your schoolyard. Um, and then one other resource I wanna highlight is um, the Plants for Living Schoolyards. Um, publication that we developed at Bay Tree Design with Trees for Oakland and Stop Waste. Um, this is focused in on uh, just a, a long tree and plant list of, of plants and trees that have um, additional benefits for the schoolyard but are low maintenance um, and so work given the limited maintenance um, capacity that our districts have. And this is an example of kind of that negotiation and process as a designer. Um, when working on Star King Elementary School, it's on um, Petrero Hill, which is a serpentine, it's serpentine bedrock, which kills a lot of trees. And there's a very limited tree palette that will work in that condition. Um, but we also had to negotiate with the district to come up with trees that they were happy maintaining. Um, and that negotiation meant that we got the right trees in, in the right space that could handle the environment that they were gonna be put in um, and be something that the district could get behind. Um, the right, that brings us to the right place. Um, the right place is really important. Um, these two images kind of show you what um, trees, like established fully grown trees can provide for a school while not really interfering with the ground level plane, which the, the ground level is where those 300 to 500 students are, are doing their daily activities. Um, so getting these trees are in what I would say is the right place. And that is the places that provide the most shade you can get on paved surfaces or turf, um, areas that would be high heat and not comfortable to be in, um, can be made a, a nat an immersive natural experience, even though they're paved at, for the foot level, so you're not getting as much erosion. If you place a tree near, uh, near enough to provide the shade, but not in a way that they're gonna get um, deteriorated. Um, one of the other things you need to do is make sure that tree has enough space for roots and branches. This protects the tree, but it also protects the pavings and build the paving and buildings. Um, one of the most common um, issues that facilities will have with trees is that they lift pavements, they intrude on water lines, <laughs> and they can like have branch breakage onto buildings. If you provide the, the space that's needed for the tree to grow larger, they won't be able to do those things. And it, it means that the tree itself will be more successful and the built infrastructure next to it will be better as well. You also need to make sure you're putting trees in spaces where there's water available. Um, especially as our climate changes, a lot of our trees might need more water when they didn't need to be irrigated before. Um, so establishing locations where you can get a water line, you can get a drip irrigation system um, next to this tree is really important here in California. Um, you also need to make sure that there's sufficient soil volume for the trees, and that will just make, mean that they ha have the ability to be um, successful long term. So what that looks like on schoolyards, um, 
is a little bit different um, on every site, but I'm going to walk you through a couple of examples. Um, this one is um, Oxford at West Campus. It's a newly um, implemented schoolyard um, on what was a kind of a abandoned school site before and um, they hadn't been using their yard for years. And then they implemented a full new redesign this year. Um, we got to be a part of that. Um, in the upper left-hand corner, you can kind of you can see the plans we did for this. And specifically, I want to point out that we um, tried to locate trees that were going to grow to be like 30, 40 feet tall at full growth in locations that went to the south or west of, of paved or turf surfaces. Um, that means that while the trees themselves are in larger planting areas, as you can see in the bottom right picture when, with the trees um, next to the field. So those trees are eight feet back from the field. They have enough soil volume to grow to their full size successfully. They're protected from the ball play in the field by the, by the logs along the edge, um, but they're located in a space that once they're fully grown, those trees are gonna provide an immersive natural experience for the turf itself. Um, and then we did, it set aside a larger landscape area, as you can see on the right, um, for to the west of the play areas, um, in which we planted more, lar even larger trees um, away from the building, but within the easy viewing distance. So this is well within that 250 meters, um, where we could put in big leaf maples and valley oaks that provide a whole lot more shade, and over time um, will completely change this school's character. Um, the second example I want to do is a project I'm really excited about. It's going into construction right now. It'll be finished by um, summer 2022. On this school site, we got to actually leverage existing natural resources. And this is one thing I really want to highlight is that planting new trees is great. Protecting already grown trees is even better. Because if you have an already established large tree that you can work in and highlight and bring a, a better connection to your campus to or better views from buildings to, um, you'll get more immediate benefits to, from that tree. Um, so on this site we had, uh, it's a middle school in Portola Valley and it had an oak woodland on one side of the campus and a frog pond on the other side of the campus. You can see those two pictures. So we have um, heritage oak trees in the top picture and then the bottom picture is the, um, the pond area. Both of, the, both of these things are kind of cut off from the current campus by the way the, the buildings were placed. And um, our, what we saw our job as is, is increasing the connectivity of the new buildings with the natural spaces so that the buildings themselves felt integrated and um, had good views of the natural resources and they, they, they became like more a part of the campus. And also making sure that the placement of those buildings um, uh, did, like took out as few trees as possible. And then when we did have to take out a tree on this one, on this um, site, we got to like replace it with like two. So if we took out a, one oak, we replaced it with like two or three. Um, and as you can see in the plan, we've got um, new, oak, new oaks planned all along the oak woodland side and um, new um, riparian trees all along the frog pond side. Um, and then we did took particular care in anywhere there was an outdoor gathering, paved outdoor gathering space, interspersing trees in um, tree wells in order to provide that immersive quality even in the lunch areas. And I've got a couple more pictures of this. One, this is what we think that the new building with the view of Windy Hill and the new um, coast live oak plantings are gonna look like. Um, and this is what that connection to the frog pond will look like and that students will have daily access to this natural environment just right outside of their, their school buildings. All right, so you've negotiated your tree list with your district and, and, or your school or your principals. Um, and then you figured out in your plans where it's best to put those so you don't have root intrusion, that you don't have um, conflict with ball play and all of those things. The next step is to um, negotiate a maintenance plan. So those first five years are critical. Um, and a couple of different ways that we've seen um, maintenance plans work in these overstretched um, districts. Um, there's a, a lot of different ways to go about negotiating this. Um, one of the ways we've seen is particularly successful is in San Francisco Unified School District. They have an MOU, which is a maintenance like agreement sort of thing where the nonprofit Friends of the Urban Forest 
has agreed to plant and then maintain trees on the schoolyards um, for the school district during that establishment period. And this is particularly successful. It means that more trees have gotten planted in San Francisco and that those trees are making it through their first years, even with those 300 to 500 kids using the school site every day on what are very constrained sites in San Francisco. Um, one of the second things we've seen really work is um, maintenance agreements. So if you have a school community group, uh, volunteer group, whatever, they before they plant, they hash out who's going to take care of what for how long um, with the district. And this can really ease tensions that might occur if you're just like, I just want to plant the tree and then you're going to take care of it. Instead, you're like, we're going to plant the trees and this is how our school site is going to take care of it. And that's a much easier intervention to, um, to sell. And then one of the other things we've seen people experimenting with their joint use agreements. And this is where the school districts and cities um, kind of come to a, con a conclusion in order to increase the amount of maintenance infrastructure that happens on schoolyards. Um, this is an image of a, of a detail we've developed for um, how you plant that tree. Because you have those 300 to 500 kids, how, how it's a good investment to do a bit more pre tree protection for that young tree. Um, then you would normally, this is a non-climbable galvanized welded wire mesh that protects the tree chunch and the root crown. Um, Canopy also has resources for best practices in planting um, if you wanna go look for those. And I keep talking about those 300 to 500 kids. Um, kids are a force to be harnessed on our schoolyards. Uh, once, what we've seen is once you plant a tree, kids love it and sometimes they love to death um, the things that, that they, they find valuable. And so you're trying to get the trees through from being a baby tree to being this kind of like resilient, fully grown um, tree, even while those 300, 500 kids are there. Um, and their tree placement is really important in this where you're not putting trees in, in locations where they're just gonna be walking over it all the time and you're getting heavy foot traffic, um, trying to protect those roots and get that soil volume. Um, but there's also a couple other interventions you can do because you can make your students have kids and students be tree stewards. Um, and these are a couple examples of kids at volunteer planting days. My favorite here is at what was formerly Washington Elementary and BUSD. They did a tree planting program that they had each class adopt a tree. Um, and then you can change those those kids that then are educated in how to take care of their natural environment. Um, so just basically who's gonna plant these trees? Um, hopefully in doing your advocacy, you get to a place where you have a pro tree school district. And so trees are planted whenever there's a modernization project. So a modernization project is they go in they make sure that everything's ADA accessible, everything's seismically safe. And what you're hoping for is at that point, they also make sure that there are more trees planted um, during those designs. And if not trees, then at least um, planting areas with water available that then volunteers and other people can come planting trees, plant trees in later, um, that your school district protects trees wherever possible, then it also has um, trees uh, replaced as part of their routine maintenance plan. So when a tree dies, because trees have a lifespan, they don't just cut it down and take care of it, they have a plan for you know, removing the old tree, but putting in new ones. Um, contractors do it as part of the, again, this is an example of contractors coming in as part of modernization. So this is the, the center, which is OUSD's central kitchen. And we did the demonstration farm and landscape design for this um, at Bay Tree. And we got in um, kind of the spine and the, some of the central trees but what we mostly did is made sure there were more areas where the soil was improved and there was water available so that later the students as part of the demonstration farm could come put in a stone orchard. And this is a visualization of what we think that will look like at full build out after the students and the farm manager and the volunteers have come and put in that, that urban, that stone fruit orchard. Um, and then just to keep in mind that end goal, that these negotiations can take a lot of time and it can be, they can often be really hard, but 
if you can get those skeptics turned into tree advocates, then you have this opportunity to make your school community one that's convinced that trees are a transformational opportunity. Um, and that this goes back to that first slide I show you. This is actually Sue Humphreys herself um, engaging in the schoolyard forest that she um, created over the course of 40 years. And so I just say like, it may take a while, but it, the goal is so worth it. Um, and I'll leave you with that and stop my share. Thanks so much, Lauren. Um, that's lots of great information and very inspiring. And I'm sure people are gonna have more questions um, coming into the Q&A uh, as we hear from our, uh, after we hear from our next and final speaker, Devin Conley. Hi, thank you so much, Elise. And um, it's the pleasure to follow such knowledgeable speakers today who are working on greening campuses. I'd also like to thank Canopy for inviting me to be a part of this webinar. Um, my name is Devin Conley and I am the board president of the Mountain View Wiseman School Board. And I'm also a parent in the district. Um, this is a picture of my son um, a few years ago, but we were fortunate enough when he was younger to be in a, um, a co-op preschool that had an outdoor classroom where kids kind of had free run in nature um, during their day. And um, that's something that I think I'm still constantly looking for, for him is finding ways to get him out in the natural environment. Um, I've spent the last 19 years working in education, but I also have a background in city planning and architecture. And I served on our city's Parks and Recreation Commission and their heritage tree um, oversight before I was elected to our school board. And so next slide, please. My presentation can you please forward the slide? Thank you. My presentation is gonna be a little bit shorter and I don't wanna to overlap too much with the information already presented. I'm gonna be looking at, um, is this a district or a school site issue? And what are some of the opportunities and constraints you could encounter at either level? Also, how do you advocate um, school districts? Are there, there's politics there, there's, a system that you have to kind of enter into and, and advocate within. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about how you navigate those spaces as well. Next slide, please. So at the district level, um, let's start with um, timing. So as mentioned by Lauren, one of the um, opportunities to add natural spaces or trees to a campus is when there are renovations or construction. She was talking about modernization, for example. Um, after the fact, on an already established site, it's, it's a little more challenging, it can still be done, but then you run into things like um, the codes for fire lanes, bioswales and drainage on the campus. There might be sewer and electrical lines in certain places that you'd think you could put a tree, but then it would have to redo all of the, the access points, or there might be a lack of irrigation. Um, to plan for when these renovations or construction opportunities come up, you can look to a school district's master facilities plan and, um, and when they're going out for uh, what we call school bonds. So in California, most school districts, public school districts rely on bonds to fund capital improvements um, because we, there's just not enough funding from the state to do it otherwise, frankly. So a responsible practice that many school districts do is they develop a master facilities plan that lays out future projects and prioritizes them. And then they go to voters and they ask the voters to pass a bond to fund those prioritized projects in the plan. So if your district is engaging in this master's facility planning process, that is the perfect time to bring up greening campuses and to advocate for natural spaces on campuses, because then it gets rolled into a future funding structure as well. Um, some of the constraints at the, well, oh, before I jump to education code, that's where I was going next. Let me talk about the process for engaging your school board. Um, I've been on the board for a couple of years now, and I sometimes forget how confusing it was when I first started watching school board meetings. So if you wanna engage your school board around an issue like this, 
you can write to your entire board of trustees. Um, usually school trustees really do appreciate community input and often you get emails when there's a huge problem as opposed to when there's an opportunity. Um, so, so writing to say, look, this is a real opportunity for our school, for our district. Um, here are the many benefits. We'd really like to partner in helping with this. That's a great way to engage your school board and um, start to get the school district team uh, on board with you. Um, you can also speak at a board meeting. Every single school board has a, a section in their board meetings for public comment on things that aren't on the agenda. So you always have the opportunity to go to a board meeting and during that time, you might have one to three minutes, depending on the district and, and whatever else is going on in that meeting that night. But you will have an opportunity to speak to the trustees about that issue. And then if it later becomes an agenda item, you can come and you can make public comments on that agenda item. Um, some of the constraints are the education code in California in particular, there are requirements for the amount of field space, the playgrounds, play structures, and even the blacktop space that are required for schools. And it's all tied to the PE curriculum. Um, as mentioned before, funding is always an issue. And that's why I think linking into the master facilities planning process and school bonds is so effective. And then maintenance is, is gonna be um, a hot topic as Lauren pointed out. Um, in our district, for example, in the Mountain View Wisdom School District, we have a joint use agreement with the city. So the city maintains the, the field space and trees on the campus. And that means that if we are going to do a lot of new plantings, how, how do we engage them as our partners in that? Next slide, please. At the school site, I wanna talk a little bit about stewardship and the difference between having a champion or advocate for trees and having a, a school culture around the stewardship of the natural environment. Um, you may be here today because you are a champion for greening school campuses, but if the role of, of nature at a school depends on just a core group of volunteers, or maybe it's the principal who's passionate about it or a couple of teachers, what happens when there are changes in staffing and students and parents at a site over time? Do you lose the people who were including nature in the school and helping to make sure that those plants and areas were taken care of. Um, if they go away, if there, is there still a culture of stewardship at that site when in that district too, to keep maintaining those spaces? Um, the stakeholders are here, parents, PTA, teachers, staff, principals at the school site. Those are all different people that you can engage and get involved. If you can tie nature to the curriculum, I know that um, in the earlier presentation about kind of the research around this, it was about exposure as much as, um, as perhaps more so than curriculum. But if you can tie it to the curriculum and bring it into the classroom or bring the classroom to the natural environment, I think it's a lot more powerful and you're gonna have more buy-in at the school site from your teachers and principal to really engage in trying to green the campus. There's planning involved around, are you doing a garden or are you adding trees? Um, we've heard a lot about trees here today. What I often hear people asking for is a garden. Um, and so can you do both at the same time? How do you wanna spend your energy and engage your school site around that. Again, money, money, I couldn't not add that to the slide because it's always an issue. And then the maintenance um, at the school site, sometimes it falls on the staff at the school site. Maybe it's the school custodian. Maybe it's a couple of teachers who've been keeping the plants alive and watering them. Um, sometimes it's volunteer based, sometimes it's the district. So those, those MOUs, those memorandums of understanding that Lauren was talking about, can be incredibly helpful in making sure that um, the green space is maintained and taken care of. Uh, the last little piece that I wanted to add before I move on that I hadn't put in here originally was to think about universal access when you go through this process as well. How do we make sure that all of the students at a school, including those with disabilities, are able to access and navigate 
green space and, um, and really get to play and interact with their peers in it. And my final slide, please. Next slide, there we go, thank you. Um, I hope that you leave today with ideas for how to increase natural spaces at your own school or district. We are all in agreement that we as humans are tied to nature and it has important benefits for our children. Um, I'm happy also to answer any questions. You can reach out to me at my public trustee email address, which is dconley at mbwsd.org. Um, but I'm also excited to see so many people who came here today to view the webinar and participate. And I hope that you can spread the word and share this information with those around you. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, let's bring everybody back for the last few minutes. We've got a little bit of time to address some questions that have been asked. Um, that those were really fantastic presentations. Thank you three very, very much. Um, so you've all been really active in answering questions in the Q&A um, directly, but I do have a few more. Um, so we'll just start off with one uh, where uh, they ask, can you talk about the, the role or the importance of districts partnering with nonprofits that can assist with planting and maintaining trees, natural landscaping, open classrooms, that kind of thing, um, instead of just taking it all on by themselves? And, and specifically, they pointed out um, nonprofits like Canopy and Living Classroom, which are both local organizations. So anyone um, could take the floor to address that if you like. Yeah, go ahead. I'm, I'm happy to respond to that a little bit. I think, so the district mindset quite often is we're always thinking about what has funding long-term versus what is one-time funding or you know, just at the moment. So um, Canopy, for example, may be uh, a one-time opportunity to have trees planted, um, but how do you maintain things long-term and Frankly, when, if there's a nonprofit, Canopy is different than this, so I'm not referring specifically to Canopy, to be clear. But some nonprofits, their budgets really fluctuate, and there's a little less stability if they're reliant on grants, for example, in terms of are they still going to be there five years later? Are they going to be there 10 years later? So sometimes I think districts fall back on trying to be self-reliant and make do with what they have because partnerships can fluctuate and may not be consistent over time. But that's where the MOU process that Lauren pointed out that was for an extended period of time with San Francisco Unified School District is, is really effective. That if you can do something that's a little bit more long-term and is you know in writing, um, that kind of eases the fear that that nonprofit is gonna disappear on the school district later on, because maybe the nonprofit didn't get the grants that they'd been expecting that year. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Does anyone have anything to add to that? I think Lauren probably does as well, because um, I, I think it's such an interest, interesting and complex um, question. Um, and Devin, I'm really glad that you went first to, to really talk from the school district perspective. In terms of schoolyard greening, which is what, where most of my experience is, although certainly um, a previous employer um, that I worked with, Open Lands, really did a lot more tree planting specifically. But there's so much to consider with community engagement and long-term stewardship and um, use of the space and potentially even supporting school districts and thinking and, and staff in particular around um, professional development of how to actually teach outside because it's different than teaching, you know, within the four walls of a classroom. And so I feel like um, nonprofit partners are very able to provide and flexibly provide different um, different things that a school district might need to have a holistic um, use um, and design of those spaces that might not be as easy for a school district to be able to do in general. Like thinking about you know full community engagement if the schoolyard is going to end up being an open access space is 
just usually not what a school district has money to do. Like you know, they're hiring a landscape architect or an ar architect firm to be able to do that. And if there's money in the budget that allows for that community engagement, then you know the community engagement may happen. But to be able to be assisted um, by a nonprofit is helpful um, in in a case like that. But I would agree wholeheartedly with Devin that um, those agreements, those partnerships, um, partnership agreements are so crucial so that in, in spending the time of developing the partnership and, and actually getting to know and trust each other is really important um, so that no one feels abandoned or like it, it, you can't work through something if an issue arises because an issue will arise. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I think, the uh, partnerships with um, nonprofits can be really profitable in this space. Like Friends of the Urban Forest is doing it successfully in San Francisco. You could go ask them about how they negotiated that. Um, trust, uh, the Trust for Public Land and Green School Yards America are doing that successfully in Oakland. You could ask them for advice on how they went through that. I do know like both, all of those organizations, um, Stop Waste in Oakland as well, um, all of those organizations, I think, did like two to four to five years of groundwork to make sure they had established that trust with the district partners before they were really like implementing what they they were doing on the ground. Because you have to you have to get to the point where, like like Jamie said, that you trust each other, um, and that like the and it might even be like timing it for like. You know, we're going to time it for when the school board switches over um, or like watching for that time that you're like, this is this is this. The time is now to like, like establish those relationships so we can establish them with trust um, because, you know, you just have you have people and you have to be in it for the long haul because a lot of people on at especially district staff levels, they're there for 30 years, 40 years like. Um, and so if you as a nonprofit aren't in it for the long haul, they can, they can tell, you know, um, and they, they need somebody who's going to be with them to negotiate when um, they're in a school board meeting and the parents are like, why don't I have shade on my school yesterday? And they can be like, well, we planted trees and they're going to grow in in six years. They, they just, they need that backing, you know, to like really stand for a green schoolyards initiative. Um, yeah, and I think it's really worth it, but I do, I, I almost always am like, you have to be patient <laughs> and persistent because um, it's not short, um, but few good things are, so. Yeah, that definitely tracks. Canopy's planted thousands of trees across several school districts in the last 25 years of existence. and. Um, you're right, trust has to be there. Um, we've had uh, maintenance agreements, MOUs, where you know it'll line up with funding, where we have funding to plant the trees and maintain them for the first three years of establishment. And in many cases has taken on longer beyond that three-year point. And we've even gotten to the point where there are many sites that are getting where we planted trees um, 10 years ago being removed because they're going to be upgrading parts of the campus now. And so we're trying to like stay in the loop so that we're going to say, okay, it makes sense maybe that you remove some of these trees, but which ones can we keep? What, which ones can we preserve? And which one, like, how can we help continue partnering with you in this next phase of replanting? Um, and so I've even seen that where like um, that relationship can keep going on even as um, trees, it's an urban forest and, tr you know, with trees, sometimes they have to be removed. That's a reality. But like you mentioned earlier, um, you know, making sure there's a plan to put them back and there's partnerships in place to do that um, to help. Devin, go ahead. Well, and that really sparked for me, um, talking about kind of long-term and longevity, the, the policy cycle, when I was talking about the master facilities plan and the bond and then actual construction or planting and then ongoing maintenance, like we're looking at, you know, easily three to 10 years to get all to get through all of those steps. So if you're here as a parent and let's say, you know, my son, for example, is in second grade and I start advocating now as a parent for this, the trees might not be there when he finishes elementary school. 
but I am working on something that's going to benefit the community long term. Or <laughs> maybe I start working at the middle school level because I know that's where he's going to be by the time the trees are ready, right? But but these um, it's the same in like city planning and urban design, for example. These projects take a long time to get through all of the different policy and implementation hurdles. And Devin, um, just to follow up on that, um, we had a question, how do people find out when the master facilities plans are updated in their local school district? How can they uh, be in the know and get involved? So what I can speak a little bit to my own district, sometimes following and engaging with different levels of government can be challenging because for example, we publish our agendas for our board meetings. Um, the law says they have to be published 72 hours ahead of a meeting. Um, we try to publish them about six days ahead so people have more time to see them. Um, but if you get six days notice and you're not you know, following along and reading everything closely, you might not realize that something is coming up at a school district meeting. Um, the things to start listening for and watching for is if your school district starts talking about bonds um, and going out for a bond, that planning process took us about almost a year um, to get through before we actually put a bond on the ballot. And so as soon as you hear bonding come up, um, that's the time to ask, hey, how are you planning to spend the money if you can get it? Are you making a master facilities plan? We went out for our, we did a master facilities plan in 2019. We passed it in November of 2019. Um, but the architect firm that we hired to help us with it, we hired in June of 2019 and they spent months um, getting input at the different school sites. So our school site council, which is a legally required body in California, there's one at every school. Our PTAs, our ELACs, the DLAC for the district, all of these different um, advisory bodies and committees that impact school campuses, they all had opportunities to give input. Um, and so there was a concerted public outreach process from the district around it. It could differ in different districts, but that's another thing to listen for, especially if you're a parent in the district, read those district emails um, and, and watch for conversation about those things to come up. Um. Yeah, and then like one other thing to to note as a for as far as like things to pay attention to um, is that uh, in the process of doing the the emergency initiative, I volunteered for the Green School Yards, Yards Emergency Initiative. Um, it came across a couple of things where people were like, make sure if you can make sure that there's um, verbiage in your kind of school site plan like stuff that allows you to use funds for outdoor classrooms like just be like hey like when you go to use these funds you can have outdoor things like trees that can be part of the curriculum that kind of allows the principal to then if, if the principal's like hey i want to use funds to improve my outdoor spaces as part of the curriculum they can use their school site funds to improve those spaces and plant trees but if you don't have that language in there that allows the use of funds in that manner then the school's like hands are tied um, so there's ways you can get in stuff that 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 uh, it allows the schools to be more flexible with their spending on outdoor um, education spaces. The same is true for bond language as well. So when a district goes out for a bond, if something is not listed in the bond language, they can't do it later. So if, if you have extra monies, let's say that um, things came in under budget and you wanna put money towards something, you can only put the money from that bond towards something that was listed in that language. So. Maybe it's not the number one priority project that's gonna happen right away, but if you can get it in that bond language, there is an opportunity to possibly fund it down the line. All right, this is really great information. I've just got one more um, quick one for you all before we wrap up. And um, I tend to ask this kind of question um, at a lot of our sessions like this. Um, so if you don't have an answer, it's totally fine, but uh, just wondering, um, what are your favorite trees for schoolyards in the Bay Area and why? Um, 
Um, anytime I can put in something like take out a eucalyptus, that's good. <laughs> um, um, I, I think some of my favorites are actually um, a valley oaks because they are really big um, and long, like have a lot of longevity. They're also pretty fast growing and they're, but they're not sensitive to, to watering. Their roots aren't as sensitive to watering as like coast live oaks. Um, so especially in our more interior areas, I think those are great. Um, there's a whole list of like patio kind of type trees that I think provide good dappled shades and constrained environments and constrained soils. <laughs> um, uh, the, a number of them are non-natives. Um, I really do prefer natives if you can get them. Um, but I think a lot of our native trees really want to be given a little bit more soil volume than we often give them. Um, yeah, uh, I think, so there, there's just, there, there's a lot of them. Um, anything that you can get in that, that grows at more than like between, like at more like a two to three feet a year sort of rate, as opposed to like a one foot a year sort of rate is gonna be highly beneficial because you're gonna see that impact a lot earlier. Um, I would say like our Bay Area has a lot of microclimates. So like giving out like a, this is the best tree for the Bay Area is actually really hard because like, you know, Oakland next to the freeway or like Contra Costa County is gonna be very different than ocean influenced peninsula. You know? Well, you answered well. It's basically a trick question almost yeah. because you know, the, the right answer is a well-maintained tree or whatever. <laughs> Just yeah. No, I mean, I like I have my personal favorite. Um, I love big leaf maples. Um, just I, I grew up in the south and like I think the big leaf maple is like the one that really hits my like, this is a green tree. Um, yeah, there's a number I people use here all the time that I hate because I feel like they're just they're southern trees that are like dwarfed in this condition I'm like don't do it that's such a sad magnolia <laughs> like just don't do it <laughs> but I I would just add that um of not having just one like the same tree repeated over and over um on the parks and recreation commission we would have people coming to us about heritage tree removal when trees were getting sick and dying and there was one street that had been planted with ash trees, the full street, and um, they all aged at the same time and the street lost most of its canopy. Um, it could also be that like if, if a tree gets diseased, it's gonna spread it to all of its buddies if they're all the same species versus if you have a variety, maybe it'll take out one tree, but it's not gonna take out your entire canopy. Very good points. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, we're going to go back to our slideshow now just uh, for a um, couple of final thoughts. So thank you again, everyone for joining us today. I have a few closing remarks. So please um, just stick around a couple more minutes if you can. Um, so as I shared at the beginning of the webinar, Canopy is still seeking candidates for the tree program's senior manager position. Um, this person is going to be responsible for overseeing all of Canopy's tree programs, which includes uh, tree planting, tree care, surveying, some education and advocacy. Uh, please visit the Canopy website to read the full job description. And uh, finally, um, just a, a reminder that we will be providing the presentation slides and this recording along with many other resources that were, were talked about. Um, in, uh, so check out the website uh, next week for a lot of that and we'll be sending some stuff in a follow-up email to you so keep an eye out. Uh, and so um, also stay tuned for Canopy's next webinar series in the fall. Uh, when you exit the webinar today, you'll be prompted to fill out a survey, ISA certified arborists. You can uh, put in your, um, your information and get your CEUs through that. Um, and to everyone still listening, um, we would just really appreciate your feedback. Um, 
anything you have about today's webinar or for the entire series. This is actually our last webinar for the More Trees Please series. Um, and I wanna just take a minute to acknowledge and thank some of the key people that made Canopy's first ever six part webinar series, such a success from kickoff last July up to now. Um, thank you first to the small but mighty team that envisioned and implemented this series. Um, Canopy's education director, Natalie Brubaker and executive director, Catherine Martineau, um, board chair, Cami Lowe and board member, Mary Dadio um, came up with this whole thing with some with some help, of course, uh, but really um, brought this thing to life and reached more than a thousand people over the course of this webinar series. Um, thanks to Igor um, at UC Cooperative Extension for being our amazing host, um, to Rose Epperson at Western Chapter ISA for getting us all these great CEUs, uh, for arborists every time, um, for uh, to the County of Santa Clara for their financial support for this series, um, to the many organizations and friends who helped spread the word about the webinars uh, during a time where we were all just sitting on our laptops all the time anyways, this was great. And um, a heartfelt thanks to all 17 amazing speakers who freely offered uh, their time, expertise, stories, and resources uh, with our community of viewers. Um, this series allowed us to reach far more people and far beyond our local neighborhoods thanks to technology. And we hope that your survey feedback today uh, will help us decide the best ways to move forward in uh, with in-person and online programs in the next year. And maybe even just tell us what you wanna know more about this fall. Uh, it'd be really helpful. So with that, I'll let you go. Um, thanks again for joining us and please enjoy the rest of your day.